so we are going to begin. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's it's 2.30 Eastern Standard Time here in America. I think it's uh, maybe 8.30 where John is. Uh, no, it's 7.30. 7.30. 7.30 in the evening. I was never good at math or geography, so uh, <laughs> forget about me. But you're good at technology, which is great. Mm. Barely, but I can handle this. So I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us here uh, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're joining us from. I uh, want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for, uh, for sponsoring this afternoon's talk and sponsoring all our virtual talks. Uh, they're a very generous group of people, and we greatly appreciate uh, all the support that they provide us with. A um, couple of uh, logistical things. Uh, everyone will be receiving an email from me tomorrow morning with a feedback survey. Uh, I'd love for you to let me know what you thought of this afternoon's event and what you'd like to see for future virtual events here at the library. Um, also, uh, I'm going to keep everyone muted during John's presentation. Uh, we're going to communicate through the chat feature and any questions you have of John, type them into the chat feature and I will make sure that to ask them to John um, once his presentation is complete. So we'll have a designated Q&A period at the end of John's presentation, but we're not going to constantly interrupt John with questions. We're going to hold our questions until the very end, okay? And we're going to get those questions into the chat. Uh, as I previously mentioned before we started recording, uh, I am recording um, this afternoon's uh, event. Um, uh, the camera should just be focused on myself when I'm talking and then on John when John's talking. It shouldn't capture anyone in the audience. Uh, we are also streaming live on Facebook, uh, on the uh, live, Tewksbury Library's Facebook page. And we will upload this video to the town's YouTube channel uh, early next week. Uh, I think I've pretty much hit everything I was going to say. I'm not going to ramble um, too much because I really want to hear what John has to say here. Uh, I did just want to acknowledge Anne Careless. Uh, I love the last name, Anne. Uh, so Anne is, is with us. Anne is the team leader at the Tewksbury and Churchdown Libraries. And she was the one that got me in touch with John and helped make uh, today's program possible. And my understanding is Anne's also going to share this live video on her library's uh, Facebook page. So um, we'll be getting some Tewksbury, England uh, viewers as well. Okay, so let me introduce John here. Um, so Tewksbury, Massachusetts is, first of all, my very first sentence I've come to learn may not be true, but I'm going to say it anyway. So Tewksbury, Massachusetts is believed to have been named after the Earl of Tewksbury, a member of the British government. There is, however, some disagreement around this. So John Dixon, life president of the Tewksbury England Historical Society, is here to give a presentation from across the pond about the history of his Tewksbury, from the Tewksbury Abbey, which celebrates its 900th anniversary next year, to the Battle of the Roses, to Tewksbury Mustard. Get to know our unofficial sister community. John was the head of the history department at his local high school uh, until he retired back in 2001. And he actually took part in an exchange program and visited Tewksbury, Massachusetts back in 1998. Uh, and that's a visit that he has fond memories of. So uh, all, uh, let's see, what are we at? About 50 or so on the line. And I'm sure the hundreds, if not thousands, that are going to watch this on demand on Facebook and YouTube. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to John for joining us here this afternoon. And John, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, everybody, for coming today to, to listen to, to me. Uh, I must ha confess to begin with that my voice is not a Chucksbury voice. I'm from the north of England. Most of our historical society members are people who have come to live and work in Chicksbury and then become fascinated in the history of this wonderful town, which gets into your bones. And I've already decided that my ashes will be scattered here when the day comes. So it's just like that. So welcome to Chicksbury, England. And as you see on the screen there, I had this wonderful experience in 1998 when I brought all these school children to Tewkesbury, Massachusetts to meet uh, uh, the, the people of the high school there. You will notice that some of them actually got to New York. I didn't, but they did. Uh, very, a great adventure for them. So it was a wonderful experience. And if I may just write, uh, read what I wrote afterwards, the contrast with Tewkesbury is amazing. 
One is first lulled into a false sense of security with the plethora of English place names. But the main difference is that, that there is space in Chutesbury, Massachusetts. It is a township which seems to have been carved out of a beautiful forest. But unlike our medieval town, there is no discernible town center. Medieval Chutesbury town boasts 9,450 people where I believe there are over 27,000 of you when we visited. The town comprises 20.7 acres, a mile, sorry, that's you, 20.7 square miles, while we only encompass 2,770 acres, of which 96 are water. So there's a big, big contrast which I found when I visited you. Ah, you haven't got me on. It's not moving, Robert. Can you allow me to move the screen? Ah, here we go. I think your people are, are, are too many, and they're going to, we're going to miss out on the. On, if you cannot move your people to the side, what's that, John? You've got. I've got too many people over my presentation. Can you move people to the side? You only need to have me and you on the screen, don't you? Yeah, John. Actually, if you go uh, to speaker view. Um, then you'll get rid of all those people on the side, I believe. Which I don't want to do, but I haven't got to speak of you now. I'd have we, to can all, we can all see you fine, John, and we can see your presentation fine as well. You won't in a minute because you're covering it, unless you're seeing different from me. I think I may be seeing different than you. Okay. So there, are, there's me 22 years ago. Uh, have I changed? That's a good question. And I'm sorry I've not got Becca with me tonight. Uh, that, that's my colleague who came over with the school party. Since uh, we went to America, she of course got married, two children, and disappeared, whereas I haven't. So 22 years ago, and she was absolutely fascinated by some guy called Thoreau, uh, who I believe lives near a pond called Walden Pond, which we did visit. I'm sure you're very excited about that uh, literature, uh, Colossus. Um, our Becca, she she's very keen on 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 literature and American literature, and we should be talking about a little bit about our own church literature today. So there is Becca. Now the next thing I am a little bit worried about this because it's 22 years ago, and we had the most wonderful hosts. Now this is where you, can you see Carol and Jerry there? Good, because I you you're in my you, I, you're covering it for me. I, I am worried, of course, because it's 22 years ago now. And I hope Carol and Jerry as well as possible, but I just want to remember them. And if any of you know them, will you let Robert know so that I can perhaps make contact later? But they were wonderful hosts, looked after us so well. And they also came, of course, to visit the UK the next year, and we had a wonderful time then. So here we are, there's Chuxbury then, Chuxbury Abbey. This is what Chuxbury is all about, this abbey, which people are absolutely fascinated about. Uh, it's called Chucksbury because it was named after a monk, a hermit called Theoc, and he lived uh, on the River Severn, and eventually he found a much better place and started to build a Saxon church there. Bury means a township, so this is Theoc's township. Now we're famous for two things, the abbey and of course for our floods, okay, because we do flood rather badly as you shall see. But as Robert did tell you, next year is going to be very important for us because we've got the 900th anniversary of the uh, Abbey, but also we've got a big anniversary for the Battle of Tewkesbury, which took place in 1471, which I won't be talking about tonight, but uh, that's another issue. So, Abbey and floods. And there you go, this is the worst flood that we've ever experienced in Tewkesbury. This was the awful year of 2007 after July the 20th and uh, as you see there Tewkesbury is a very you'll be horrified how small Tewkesbury is look at it that's it it's all surrounded by water the abbey never floods the monks knew where to build it the crypt does and, and, and some of the, 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 the graves underneath do but um, there it is and it's absolutely good we actually like it in the floods because we're totally self-sufficient man and we can't be ruled by import, more important people. But that's it's terrible. A lot of people suffered from it and uh, went out of their homes for about a year. And that's the river 
Severn, you can see in the background there, which is the longest river in, in England, a bit like your Mississippi. And we also have the River Avon, Shakespeare's Avon, which joins the River Severn and creates havoc here. On, it usually comes once a year. Most of the time we can live with floods here. That was a summer flood that was totally different and that was very difficult to live with. Now this man, you might recognize him because he's been to Chichester, Massachusetts on quite a number of occasions. This is our town crier, Mike Keane Price. And he's a very keen uh, member of the twinning committee. As you see there, he's dressed in 18th century garb and uh, he's a very important member of our town. He actually stayed in Gloucester, you spell it Gloucester, on Rhode Island, and he's visited in 1976 all the six Gloucesters in uh, America, and he's also visited in 1999, 2000, 2005. He also met somebody called Sue Nielsen, who was the owner of the Chip Street Town Crier, which I presume was a newspaper. I hope uh, Stu is well. And he was guest of honor at the high school homecoming. And there was a parade led by select men. And also the local Minutemen who were parading in 1770, dressed in 500 drums. It's quite an interesting experience for historian actually going to a town where the British got defeated. Uh, we're not too keen on that, but we have to accept it. Because of course the British Redcoats retreated from Concord famously in 1776. When he did come, he read, he read the Riot Act, and uh, he did say that the homemade beer was good and plentiful. So Mike, like me, has got very happy memories of Shipsbury, Massachusetts. Now, uh, we think this is a, a wonderful new uh, bit of sculpture in Shipsbury called the Touching Souls. And we do think it was, um, it was designed by a, a man from, from Shipsbury. So if any of you want more information on that, I, I'd love to know. But it's a lovely modern addition to Tewkesbury. Uh, it's very medieval, but this is modern and it's wonderful. It's just outside our abbey. And there you'll see the, the Bell Hotel, one of the original uh, public houses in Tewkesbury. That was there for the, the pilgrims who came to, to worship at the abbey. So that's a nice modern sculpture. I John, I'm going to guess that that sculpture was from a sculptor named Miko Kaufman. Yes, that's right. Yes. Is, is he still with you? Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, his estate, though, actually left uh, a lot of his miniature sculptures to the library. And we're actually uh, going to be putting them on display uh, when the library reopens. Uh, we're also going to have a uh, virtual lecture for Miko Kaufman in January. Uh, which I believe is his birth month. So um, anyway, he passed away a few years ago. He's probably one of our most, he is our most world-renowned resident. Um, and uh, yes, that, that would have been the sculptor. Well, I hope you'll tell his family how much appreciated he is in Tewkesbury. Yeah, which is good. So here we go. This is what it's all about, Tewkesbury, the Abbey. And the, it's a unique Abbey in, in England because it's one of the few that were not, were not knocked down by the famous King Henry VIII. You know about his six wise ladies, don't you? And so he didn't uh, knock this church down. Why? Because he was interested in money. And the people of Tewkesbury clubbed together and raised 453 pounds to buy the church off him and create it into our parish church. And we only was, lost a, a small part of it, the Lady Chapel uh, to, to the Puritans, but. Uh, of course, this is what attracts people from all over the world to come and see Tewkesbury, a beautiful Norman Abbey. It's the biggest Norman non-cathedral in the country. And the cathedral we have now is in Gloucester, just down the road. So this is not quite so important now, but it was as a monastery in the 15th century and 16th. We're also famous, we're actually, yeah, we're more famous for dissenters, people of uh, a non-conformist religion in Chicksbury, especially in the 16th, 17th century. But that was, of course, against the law. And you can see one of the oldest Baptist chapels in the country, in England, which is in Chicksbury there, and that was set up in 1623. And it's quite amusing in a way because it's been set up just underneath the shadow of the abbey, which must have annoyed the, the churchmen 
greatly in, in those times. So that is the old Baptist Chapel, which you can visit today. And if you look inside of it, it's a typical Baptist Chapel. It's got the pulpit there, which uh, was the most important part of the chapel for interpreting the Bible. And you see there where uh, people were totally immersed if they wished to uh, join the, ch the church officially. So it's still there for you to visit in Tewkesbury, well looked after by our John Moore Museum. And also, we, got a, we had a big Quaker presence in Tewkesbury. And believe it, believe it or not, that was the first Quaker chapel. It's uh, had a lot of life since. And uh, George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, he came to speak here in those three years you see there. So again, Tewkesbury was a very important dissenting place. And the, and the Quakers played a very big part in our early history. Now, yeah, you're gonna be shocked by this because uh, American cities seem to be very well planned on the gridiron pattern and very geometric. Uh, we can't do that here. You have to appreciate Tewkesbury is limited by land that doesn't flood. So, uh, and that's our big problem. We've got very little land. And there you see the, um, how small it is really. It, it, this is from 1798. There's the Abbey. Everything else depends on the Abbey. And uh, I'm hoping beneath, I can't see it on my screen, but you should be seeing three roads come together there. And also they come together in a Y shape. The north you go to Worcester, and the north east you go to Oxford and London, and the south you go down to Gloucester. So, and then the middle there, I hope you can see, we have what we call the cross, which is the war memorial where the three roads meet. So Tewkesbury is very small and very compact, as you'll see later. You would be horrified, I think, if you came. Now, this is where I'd like to ask you to put your hands up, which you can't do, and tell me if you read this book, John Halifax Gentleman. Gillian, you're, you're all shaking your heads, the ones I can see, because we are told that Americans still read John Halifax Gentleman, and they come over to Tewkesbury to try and find out places which are mentioned in the book. And Robert's never heard of it because he's too young. Um, but uh, gosh, I hope you have because American visitors have come over, uh, mostly through the 20th century, trying to trace this book. And it's, a, it's not a book that appeals to young people today. It's a very moral tale, a very a Victorian tale of a man who is brought up from poverty, but because of his education, because of his non-conformist qualities, he becomes quite a rich man in, in, in the uh, milling trade, but he also cares very much for his um, workmen. And uh, so, you know, he, he was a great hero in the mid-Victorian period. And I have had a, an email to this year from a, a a young uh, professor in America who wants to do a program in Chicago based upon John Halifax. And I'm still amazed that they do. Now, there you can see our modern author, I hope on the, on the top there, that is John Moore. Now, he is our most famous local author. I'm now going to click, and that's his famous book about Tewkesbury. And if you want a good book to read about Tewkesbury, to learn what it was like. He had a great sympathy with the poorer people in Chicksbury. It's really well worth reading. He's a witty man. And he wrote that in 1945. And uh, again, I can, if you have, uh, you, you ought to read it if you're interested in Eng English literature and also Chicksbury literature as well. Now, uh, I'm going to use an old teacher's technique. Now, I'm going to insult my audience. Uh, I'm not going to do it. John Moore did it in 1929. So it's not personal. John Halifax, gentlemen, is a wonderful economic asset for our town. Why the uneducated American loves it is difficult to explain. But let me differentiate clearly between him and the educated America, who is really seen on our shores. And it is a curious fact that this strange product of modern civilization respects John Halifax. Most of all, his gods and his idols. Perhaps it is connection with the word gentleman. Then he goes on. The uneducated American is a born snob. 
He flocks eagerly every summer to see where his idol lived, and Chipsbury reaps, reaps rich harvest from him. In fact, John Halifax is a monument of dullness. Its character is as useless as clay, and its sentiment is so sugary, so sickly sweet, that not even the author's straightforward prose could breathe life into the book. Well, there you go, that's our famous, and you'll be very pleased to know that when his rich uncle found out, read about what John, uh, John Moore had said about John Halifax, he sacked him. He said, you are going to earn your own living, young man. If you want to be a writer, go and be a writer, but not on my money. And he did. And eventually, 1945, he wrote his famous book. But there you go. So I hope you're not too insulted, my, my audience. I'm sure you're very educated. And this is a little bit from John Halifax. They've made a film in the 1920s about it. I'd love to see it. It's all black and white. But uh, that's, the, that's the, the actors there. And I hope you can see behind, we do have a monument to the author. And she was known as Mrs. Craig. And, uh, but actually her name was Diana Mullock. And you won't be surprised to know she was a, a non-conformist minister's wife. But the Americans were very frustrated they came to find what she talked about because she only ever visited Chipsbury on a Sunday afternoon. And she fell in love with the town and went away and wrote, and read, read, wrote this romance about the town, which has got very little in common with us, but uh, people believe that. Yeah. And, and John Halifax, the hero, he had, a, he had a factory a long way away and he used to commute every day on horseback. It's a little bit like going from Chuxbury Mass to Lowell. Now, could you do that, Robert, on a horse every day as a commute? No, we don't know. So there are. So that's Mrs. Craig, Diana Mullock. And that's the Bell Hotel we've just been talking about, as it used to look at in the old days. And then, of course, uh, this is a little bit more modern. It hasn't changed much today. And this is one of these wonderful old Chooksbury buildings. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can be uh, misled by the beautiful black and white so-called Tudor image, which is uh, the way we like to portray the Middle Ages, but it wasn't quite like that. Now, this is a little proof here that uh, the Tories used to flock to Chucksbury to see Abel Fletcher's milk. Now, Abel Fletcher was the, the, the main uh, um, character in John Halifax, John Halifax, gentlemen. He was a miller and uh, also was a tanner. And we like to convince the American visitors that this was actually his mill. Well, it's, it's been there since the Middle Ages, so it's a pretty good one. But they used to make a good living and to get in the tourists, you see the 1930s charabangs coming down to Chukchi from Birmingham, which is only just up the road there, to, have, to enjoy their leisure time. But if you come and see it today, there'll be no mention whatsoever of Abel Fletcher's Mill. It's now a very posh conversion into luxury flats. And anybody coming there will be very disappointed that they won't find much reference to Abel Fletcher. And there we are, Abel Fletcher. And there we are, we're going to our cross now. We very rarely get snow in Chooksbury. We're a very mild place. We get a lot of rain, but we don't get much snow. So to see this on the, uh, the wall, it's quite wonderful. We, uh, we lost um, over 190 men in the First World War who were commemorated there. We lost one woman but she was not commemorated because she was a woman and she died of the flu. We recently rededicated her name to that memorial. And then we lost 33 in World War II, one of which was a woman and her name was on the war memorial. And we've lost one fighting in Northern Ireland and none in Korea. So that's our war memorial. And of course, on the 11th of November every year, this place is packed. The townspeople always come in to pay their respects to the people who were not only were killed in the war and also were badly wounded as well. So that's our cross or war memorial. 
what were we famous for? Uh, it, the late 18th century, early 19th, say from 1750 to 1840, we were a very prosperous town. And it was based upon those contractions, though, which we call mail coaches or stage coaches. And of course, um, people on the stage coaches, they can only do 70 miles a day. And so they need luxurious hotels to stay in the evening, to have meals, beds, and also, of course, look after their horses. And this is one of the most important um, uh, coaching inns in the town, the Swan Hotel. Sadly, it's closed now, and uh, it's now uh, a shop. They, they've kept some of the building quite nice, but it's gone. Why are they dressed up like this? It's because in 1928, we did a commemoration of the day when Charles Dickens visited, Mr. Pickwick visited Tewkesbury. He stayed at another inn, which you can vote to, uh, visit today, the Hot Pole Inn. And he got, he ate so well and drunk so much brandy that he had to be taken on the rest of the journey to Birmingham in the dickey, which was a very small box where you put your trunks in the coach and they sang bawdy songs all the way to Birmingham. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Charles Dickens did actually visit Shrewsbury for a very short time. And this is, of course, our the other stone building in the town. You'll notice that most of the town is made of bricks made in the River Seven. But this is our town hall. And uh, this was um, built, started in 1788 and finished in 1857. But it's rather a splendid building. And I have to tell you that until 1974, we ran all our own affairs. Sadly, now we've been merged into a bigger unit and we've lost a lot of our power. But that is the seat of, was the seat of power in Tewkesbury, a lovely building. And uh, what's it got to do with Mad King George? You, you, I mean, you, you know about him because uh, he was the king when you expelled Britain from your, your country and you gained independence. Um, he visited Tewkesbury in 1788. He actually stayed nearby. He was more interested in Cheltenham and, and the waters there as a spa town. But the interesting thing was, just after his visit to Tewkesbury, he then went mad. So I don't know if there's any connection at all between the two. And you were talking earlier, Robert, about why you're called Chucksbury, Massachusetts. Um, I think you need to give me a few clues, but I think the link may be that the Hanoverian kings, the Georges, one, two, and three, that they have, what they always named their son before he became a lord or an earl, they would name them after a town. And so Baron Chucksbury, was a son of the King of England, the Georges. And uh, so that might be the link. And I really want you now, I challenge you out, Robert, and the people of, of Chucksbury, Massachusetts, to give me a few clues so that we can really nail this reason why you're called Chucksbury. Now, talking about John Moore, he was the son of, uh, of auctioneers, pretty well off in Chucksbury. And that was his. Um, that was their office there, Moore and Sons. Notice the black and white characteristic so-called medieval Tudor buildings, okay? But I'm afraid it's a bit of a fake, and I want you never to trust a facade. This was once very elegant, and now it's common. Again, I might insult you slightly in a minute. It was said to be the horribly restored number 46 High Street black and white and this is what it looked well partly looks like today and i want you to look very carefully there because this is Tewkesbury's own turin shroud it's all been painted when uh let's see and you can see just underneath the painting the black and white medieval house is emerging from the background there uh, i'm afraid today it's an american uh, bit of culture it's subway do you call it somewhere in America? I wonder if you do, but it's a very lovely, lovely coffee. The one I liked in, in America actually was Dunkin' Donuts, although I don't approve of Dunkin'. So I think they've come over here as well. And this is John Moore, where he was born, where, where he was brought up. This is the, the Tudor Hotel, which again is still a hotel today, and you can, you can stay there if you wish to. It's a very historic building, only it's not as historic doesn't it's not as 
sorry, it is more historic than it looks. Uh, and that's, of course, where John Moore wrote a portrait of Elmbury. And he said, that this other famous architectural historian said, the facade suffered the indignity of being covered by floorboards. And that's what it is. It's not genuine. This is what the, the actual house looked like in the, in the 17th century. And it's a very famous non-conformist seminary where a, a, an Archbishop of Canterbury, who was of a Protestant ilk, was um, educated himself, Archbishop Secker. So it's a famous building, it's an old building, but I'm afraid all that black and white is our concept of what the medieval houses should look like. And there's another one that the town clerk said it was horribly tarted up, he said, which is not a nice term. In other words, they just stuck the black and white on. But this, if you like, is our 1776, this is our Boston Tea Party in, uh, in Chucksbury. And we're not a rebellious people, really. We're a very mild lot of people. But we were very angry in the 1960s when the, the authorities wanted to knock down a lot of the medieval buildings and build a modern shopping centre in their place. And this was the building which rallied the people of Tewkesbury around to set up a civic society so that never again could buildings like this just be knocked down without planning permission? And all sorts of laws were passed after this to stop us knocking down buildings unless we have permission to do it. So that is the Doddo Cafe. Doddo was a, a Saxon thane who was deposed by the Normans. So again, similar rebellion, you see. Nearby is again, we get back to the John Halifax gentleman. American people like to come and find Sally Watkins College. Cottage, and that's a typical alley in Tewkesbury when it was inhabited by poor people, and a uh, bit of black and white there. But that was swept away in this uh, this iconoclasm of modernity. And uh, this is what was knocked down. Again, I say never trust a facade. Always look in Tewkesbury, the buildings behind, and this is what the buildings behind the, the high street looked like. Very genuine medieval buildings. Okay, they've got a bit of black paint on them to differentiate, but that's what they look like, and they were all knocked down in the name of progress. That's what the frontages look like. Again, you can see there's nothing particularly beautiful about them, but they were, they were unique, and they had a history, and they deserve better. This is what we got instead. Now, I don't know what you think about that. I don't know if we've got any architects in the audience, but... Uh, we tend to dislike that building today. We shot there quite happily. We call it the Kremlin, which is an insult to that beautiful medieval building in Moscow. This is more like the Lubyanka, I think, which is the, the prison in, in Moscow. But uh, so that's what we have now as a shopping center. That's what replaced lots of medieval buildings. And had the planners got their wishes, lots more buildings would have been knocked down as well. But the civic society stopped them. You cannot now knock any building down without just cause and getting permission. So there was a benefit from that. Uh, let's now talk about happy architecture. This is Anne Curtis's library in Tewkesbury. And this was built 10 years after uh, the horrible iconoclasm of, of the rest of the high street. And the architect who did this is called Bob, um, Bob Besick. Uh, he tried to blend in with the different stars in Tewkesbury. He was next door was a lovely 18th century mansion there, you can see it. And uh, there's the library. And also it looks out on this horrible new building. So he's put bits of the horrible new building as well. But it's a lovely building. He's got the best office up there. He's got some superb views of Tewkesbury. Uh, that's where we go. And Curlish is, that's her domain there and it's a lovely library to work in it really is and downstairs there's all meeting rooms and look on the top there that clock that reminds us that we used to have cattle markets in Tewkesbury where sheep and cattle that were sold uh, and they used to walk down the street to get to market until the railways came so 
Um, so it's a good bit of architecture. It tries to blend the history of Tewkesbury with a modern light building, which is very pleasant to work in. I'm sure Anne would tell you it's a lovely place to work. Now this is just to remind you what Shooksbury really was like, how crowded it is, because there's no land. And we had a growing population. Why? We used to make um, stockings in Shooksbury. If you th think about uh, the town crier, for example, or any 18th century man in, in his, in his uh, buckles and breeches, but he used to wear stockings that, joined, that went up to his knee. They were made in Shooksbury. And we were quite famous for them until the Industrial Revolution took over. And so you can see how crowded Tewkesbury was in the centre. I'm sure you people wouldn't like living there at all. We do. We love living in these islands. And that people will spend a lot of money now on buying houses in Ireland. Oh, gosh. And this is what that area looks like today. Oh, my word. So we've got uh, a few of the old buildings there, which are quite substantial ones. Uh, but behind it, uh, that's this modern shopping centre. All these cars, look, that's what it was done for, for love of cars. We used to have a super swimming pool there called Cascades. And they've got rid of that in the last 10 years. Uh, it's a great shame. But uh, So that's what modern Shopsbury looks like. There's the library. It's okay, and there's a Rose's Theatre again. It's an ugly building, but some wonderful theatricals go on there, and it's something we're very proud of. Over there is a Church of England, it's Anglican, but it's built in 1837 and it's built for the working people of Tewkesbury to worship because the Abbey was regarded more for the, the, the elite of Tewkesbury, if you like, and that is a very popular church today with young families. So that's the modern Tewkesbury then. Ah, now railways, are they important to you? Uh, I had to go on a train, I think it was to Boston from your area. We had the most wonderful conductor who when he knew where we were from, he, he announced it over the tunnel, he was absolutely lovely. But we love our steam railways, or well, my generation does anyway. And this is the only picture of the first railway station that we had in Tewkesbury. It was opened in 1840, one of the early railways. And it, I think that the architecture is beautiful, the stonework. I think it's the second most beautiful station in the country, next to one we call St Pancras. Uh, check it out on your Google later, St Pancras, see if you agree. But the beautiful, beautiful, uh, structure there. Uh, that engine, um, well, it, uh, it didn't really belong in the small railway. It was quite a big engine, but uh, there we go. And, and if you can see behind, to, they weren't supposed to bring the engines outside this side of the, that building. But they, for some reason that day, they wanted to break the law. And to do it, you could see they had to carve a niche to get that funnel through the, the, the archway there. Very, very uh, vandalism that one. But, uh, they cl that closed soon afterwards. We got a second railway in 1864, which lasted until 1962, when it disappeared because people were not using the railways anymore. You might have heard of a man called Dr. Beachy, everybody blames him, but this railway disappeared before he could close it. We also used to be famous for boat building. Um, a lot of people in Tewkesbury don't appreciate how important we were, and I, I hope you agree, the, this fleet of Bathurst boats is absolutely beautiful. And these were made about the year 1900, built out of wood, built in Tewkesbury, and uh, something we can still be proud of. And he trained an awful lot of workers who carried their skills on. In World War II, uh, we made... Uh, Harbour, uh, we, we made harbour defence vessels, we made motor torpedo boats. And you can see there in that lovely architectural design, it looks like a yacht and it was built by yacht builders. And, it, and you'll be pleased to know that uh, the Americans and the Australians bought some of these ships in World War II and it ended up um, fighting the Japanese in the Timor Sea. And so we're very proud that a Tewkesbury made vessel 
playing an important uh, role. Another one was the German surrender in uh, Antwerp in 1944. So our boats, something to be proud of. And the other thing we're very proud of, and I hope you can see this because I can't, is our most famous, you, you think you know about Bill Shakespeare. That's the wrong Bill Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare's Bill Shakespeare. And uh, he, he won some uh, speed records on water in the 1960s, 113 miles an hour, uh, he did. But sadly, this is the last photograph of him because a few seconds after that photograph was taken, his boat uh, flipped over and he was killed, he was drowned, and his body has never been found. And that's why many people, of course, in Tewkesbury, I think the world of Bill Shakespeare. And why was he famous? It wasn't just for the word speed record. It's because he, he was trained in wood to build ships in wood, but he learned how to make ship boats out of fiberglass, which of course were far faster than wooden boats. And that boat you see there, the Tewkesbury Stinger, is a fiberglass boat. And that's why he's famous, not because he died, but because he's adapted boats to this new material. So that is our Bill Shakespeare, not the one from Stratford. Yeah, this is a bit like look, your Lowell, isn't it? This is the biggest industrial building in Tewkesbury. It was built in 1865 and it's a flour mill, a bit like Abel Fletcher's flour mill, but far more modern. And it was known as the Borough Steam Mills because it was all powered by steam or no water wheels in there, all powered by steam. And even when I started teaching in Tewkesbury in 1983, we used to go around there. It was then powered by electricity. You could eat your dinner off the floor. It was such a clean place to work. And it employed so many generations of Tewkesbury people. And their sons went to work there. It was a, a wonderful, we, we, we respect what the healings did in Tewkesbury. But sadly, in 2006, an American company took it over, ATM, I think they're called, from Chicago. They bought it, and what did they do with it? They closed it down straight away and moved all the operations down to Bristol. And we're left with it now as a rotting hulk. We, nobody knows quite what to do with it. This bit will have to be knocked down because it's leaning. That bit is very well, well built. He, the first floor will have to be given over to flooding for a car park, get the cars out quicker when the flood starts. But we think that building might end up as luxury flats. So if you come in 10 years, you might be able to buy a luxury flat there. But it's very, very sad. Uh, it hurt the, the, the people choose me to lose that wonderful institution. Ah, I did ask Robert if he knew about this American lady. And he, and he didn't. We've got a memorial in our abbey to her, she's obviously that important. Erected to the memory of Victoria Woodall Martin, an American citizen, long resident in this neighborhood, who devoted herself unsparingly to the people that could promote the great cause of Amer Anglo American friendship. Born in 1838, died in 1927. Now, have you ever heard of her? I wonder. Um, I doubt it. That's what she looked like when she was the lady of the manor in Tewkesbury. And she was the only woman who stood as candidate for the presidency of the American states, probably before um, Mrs. Clinton, I suspect. But we're going back an awful long way. That's her official name after she married a rich Englishman. She was born Victoria Claflin. And she was born the, the daughter of, uh, he was a jack of all trades. And his mother was, a, her mother was a domestic servant. She got married to a Mr. Woodall in age 15, had two children. One of them was called Zula Bald. She came over with her and she gave a lot of money to Aunt Abby. So she's well, she's well remembered. She then got divorced and married a man called James Blood. And that's why she's known as Mrs. Blood. Uh, she never did take the name, you'll be pleased to know, but she married him. But she eventually got to know a famous American called Cornelius Vanderbilt and he advised her how to make money on the stock exchange and she did rather well and eventually in 1871 to 1872 she stood to be 
to try and be nominated as American president. Now, you know how difficult it is to do that in America. In theory, you can do it. In practice, you've got to have wealth and influence. And, but she frightened the, the men of the time so much that they fake fabricated a charge against her. And when she had to hand in her papers, they locked it in the local jail. So she never did stand for president. You're probably pleased, ladies, because she was very much a, a women's right, a rights lady. She actually uh, advocated free love. But she eventually met this a banker from Tewkesbury who was visiting America. And they fell in love and got married. And they came to England. The Martins are a banking family well known in this country. They, she lived in a little village near Tewkesbury. And then she, she changed completely. She became a, a, a very good uh, lady of the manor who cared for her people. First telephones, first um, lights in the, in the town. She was very well liked by her people. Now they were going to make, I can't, I hope you can see, can you see an actress there called Nicole Kidman? I presume you heard of her. Oh, they were going to make Mrs. Kidman play Mrs. Woodall Martin. And there you can see the headline there, Kidman, Courts, controversies, Mrs. Satan. The other point about her was when she was young, she was into all sorts of uh, nefarious religious cults. And there is a book written about her called Mrs. Satan. So I do think if they ever, they never will make that film, Nicole Kidman would have been uh, the early Mrs. Woodall Martin. She would never have played the wonderful lady, the manner that we respect and we, and we remembered in Tewkesbury. But there you go, they'll never make that film. Ah, right. Now, the Americans did come to Tewkesbury in a big way in 1943-44. And this was the most important American logistical base for D-Day. All the, all the machinery needed for a lot of it was made in Tewkesbury and shipped down to the coast. It was that important and uh, the Americans made a big impression on the people at Tewkesbury, as you would imagine, when their GIs came. Um, in 1994, um, our history site, we went to the camp, which is still there, the camp's still there. We wanted to see what was left of the Americans. That's me, by the way, you can see my hair there. Uh, there's not much to see about the Americans. There's the V sign for victory, 1944. And their slogan was, keep them rolling, keep them rolling. And that's what they did. They, they did a wonderful job in the war. Um, Patton came here. He had his uh, his uh, command vehicle built in Tewkesbury, so he visited. We also had Eisenhower here at one time to see what was happening. So I've got to emphasize, for those two years, it was a very important American establishment in Tewkesbury. And yeah, well, this is what we do like. Um, this, an eg example of a man, Yang, I used to go on about this soldier, about Yankee ingenuity, which they had and their humor. You have to accept that this was a nice, peaceful posting for a lot of these soldiers. They were all engineers and technical men, and there was no war here, no fighting. And some of them built that bike, and that bike is famous in Tewksbury. If I give this talk to uh, older men in Tewksbury, especially who were young boys at the time, they used to delight in capturing that bicycle because the Americans had to come into Tewksbury. We had something which was irresistible for the American palate. That's fish and chips. And in those good old days, we used to eat fish and chips out of newspapers. And they're very, very tasty. And the Americans, the Americans ate the whole country dry of fish and chips in, in the Second World War. And that's why they wanted that five-man bike to cycle the three miles into Tewksbury get their fish and chips. The boys would kidnap that bike and ransom it back for candy. Because I hope you know, the, the Americans have got a very good reputation for being so generous to children. If you've got any gum chum, et etc. et cetera, et cetera. So they were very pop. And those old men today, they remember being young boys and ransoming that bicycle. Right, so lots of positives about the Americans. And of course, the women loved them. And this is our lovely GI bride. This is Mary Smith on her wedding day. And uh, she, was a, she worked in the post office, the, the telegraph office, you would call it. 
And the Americans used soldiers used to come in on a Saturday morning and they used to try and chat up these girls by um, saving all their dimes and their quarts or whatever you have in America, farthings and halfpennies to us. They would bring them into the post office for the girls to count them. And of course, the chatting up would go on there. And then some of these girls fell for these Americans and uh, eventually got married. And this is, I hope you can see this because I can't. This is Mary on her wedding day to her handsome GI. The sad thing was that he had been bad. He was one of the few from Tewkesbury GIs who actually had to go and fight in France. And he was wounded in France. And he was uh, put in hospital in England. And Mary rushed down to Southampton where he was in hospital to take care of him. And they married in, that's Tewkesbury Abbey, in February 1945. And uh, it should have been living happily ever after. But it was very difficult. The American government didn't approve of American soldiers marrying English girls, and certainly British government didn't approve of it either, and they put as many handicaps as they could in the way of these GI brides. She had to wait a year before she got permission to join her husband in America, and eventually when the British did get around to it, they put the, all these brides and their hundreds of children onto the Queen Mary and sent them to, to their husbands and to their happy future life. This wasn't a happy ever after story. The marriage didn't last. But uh, Mary eventually went back to America, and married a second time, was very, very happy. She came back here in 2007. She was promptly flooded out. Great tragedy, but she was a great spirited lady. She was absolutely beautiful. And she had a lovely Midwestern accent and she knew how to dress. I just so miss seeing her on the high street now. She's, she's passed away. But, uh, there you go. There's another story. Shall I share it with you? Uh, I think you're old enough to look at the other side of life as well. Okay, because of course, when men and women get together, children are often the result. And I'm afraid you might not like it, but they were called at the time brown babies. And there you can see Tewkesbury's most famous brown baby. And look how that could have been my school in the 1950s. Look how smart he is with, with the other. He, he was a very popular man. And uh, he was the son of an uh, American GI. And I, I hope you all appreciate that in those days, to get married, you had to get permission of your commanding officer. And I'm afraid there's no uh, marriages between soldiers and civilians was frowned upon, as I've explained. Uh, this was absolute taboo. The, the English girl who was the mother of this child was not allowed to see the father after the child was born and he never saw his, his father as far as we know and that's a, a very interesting story which a lot of research is being done at the moment on the fate of these brown babies and um, now ladies I'm going to show you a picture now which would have had you swore, swooning about 20 years ago and so this is Fibo again as he grew up and there he is, he was the most handsome man. What's he doing, you ask? Well, in the good old days, we used to have fun in Shrewsbury. Uh, we used to raise money for charity. And to do that, the men, of course the men, used to uh, build uh, prams like that, out of wood and anything they could find out. And then they had a race once a year around the town. Now, there was a handicap in this race that you had to stop at about 10 pub, public houses on the way and down a pint of beer and then run on to the next pub to down another pint of beer. So it was a very drunken occasion, a very happy occasion. A lot of money was raised for charity. And here you see Fibo was the winner that year. He was pushing uh, the winner and with his proud cup there. But I'm afraid that all the health and safety people got involved and it was decided it was too much fun, too dangerous, and we don't do that anymore. But that's our fever, so, and uh, you can see why the ladies used to swoon ones who remember him. So let's end on a positive note. Tewkesbury, uh, what are we famous for today? Well, this isn't in Tewkesbury, this is the famous GCHQ, which I hope you Americans know about because you're very involved there, it's our spy centre and um, a lot of Tewkesbury people and people locally work there today 
and a lot of Americans come over to work with our, our military. So it's very much uh, an Anglo-American institution. Very modern, um, very modern design. We call it the donut. No dunk in there, but that is the donut. And uh, so it's uh, very, very interesting. And it does provide good jobs to the locality, but not in the town, because that's on the edge of Chatham. It's very worrying, actually, because it's very near an airport. And I think it's a great security risk. But there we go. It hasn't been attacked yet. And I thought I'd introduce an American company to you, just to show these American, Anglo-American today. Does Moog mean anything to you? Are you nodding? I can see that Ginny nodding us. Is that an American company? It's Aerospace. And it's one of the, the, the most important companies we have in Tewkesbury. It's just announced a 40 million pound investment in this new building. And this will give Tewkesbury, inside Tewkesbury, jobs for skilled, very highly skilled technical people for the future. So we still do have these links with America. You don't seem too sure about Moog, I don't know. Gentleman, oh, the gentleman's shaking his head. Oh, I wonder what they call it in Moog, I should have looked, in America, I should have looked it up, but sh it is an American company. So there we are. This is our historical society presenting uh, all these photographs for the good people of Chooksbury, Massachusetts. And thank you very much for your welcome of 22 years ago. That's it, Robert. Great, thank you so much, John. So at this point, folks, we'll take uh, five to 10 minutes of questions. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, get them into the chat. Uh, Diane in the chat actually uh, put a link in. Uh, you can actually read John Halifax, gentlemen, uh, for free on Google. Um, Daisy said, I actually visited the Abbey a few years ago while visiting England. It was amazing. I was lucky to hear the organ practice. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's a wonderful experience to see in that Abbey. It really is. And we, we used to do it with the school once a year at Christmas. And I just missed that so much. It was lovely. Yeah. And the, the Abbey is quite unique. The organ is quite unique as well. Mm. Uh, Christopher noted that the vicar and the mayor also visited Tewksbury Mass uh, back in yep. the 1980s. Uh, sorry, the yeah, 1990s. That's right. Well, that would, you would have our town cry with them, I'm sure, then, you yeah. know. It, they're very, very active in, in that, that period of time until after 1998, for some reason, they started to go to New Jersey, I don't know why, whether you know or not, I don't know. But I thought that was disappointing. I'd want to continue visiting you. Yes, we're going we're gonna to add that to our list of unsolved mysteries. Why, yeah, you should, yeah. Why, why Tewksbury, New Jersey is now sort of the unofficial sister community and, and why, why we were dropped for some reason. <laughs> we'll, we'll look into that. Mm. Um, uh, now, I would like to know how to pronounce Tewksbury. Uh, how do, how, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, people in Tewksbury will say that I don't do it properly because uh -huh. I'm a foreigner. Uh, local people call it Chucksbury, and I've even seen it spelled by people, not literate people, C-H-U-C-K-S-B-U-R-Y, like some American hoodlum, I mean, Chucksbury. So that's how you should call it, Chucksbury, yeah. Although probably somebody are wincing in the audience there if they're listening in, Chucksbury. That's how we say it today, or they say it. Uh, let's see. I don't really see too many other questions. Uh, people are discussing the spellings. Our spellings are slightly different. Um, Very different. You can't spell Gloucester either. Mm. <laughs> Worcester, Gloucester, Tewksbury. That's, we, right. we, we that's Roman, you see. That's the problem. Gloucester is a Roman uh, derivation. That's why it's so different. Gloucester. Yeah. Cester is in Rome, in Latin, it's a, a castle or a fortress. Glo was the name of the River Seven. It was the Rush, a Roman name for the River Seven. And um, you, you didn't bring it up, um, uh, John, and maybe maybe it's not the reference, but but I've, I've heard the phrase Tewksbury mustard. Uh, ah, yeah, I sh yeah, you'd be annoyed. I didn't talk about Tewksbury mustard. Something uh, to do with thickness or something? I'm not even sure what, what, what the phrase no, is. It's, it's Shakespeare, it's Falstaff. 
in Henry the Fourth, Part Two. He used the phrase as thick as Tewkesbury mustard. Now, people locally might be upset by that, that we aren't thick, but he didn't mean you were thick, thick can mean unintelligent. He didn't mean that at all. He, thick as Tewkesbury mustard, it was sharp as. It was a, if you ever eat Tewkesbury mustard, it, it's very sharp on the tongue. And it was quite, it was actually a compliment to the people of Tewkesbury. Uh, not, not insulting their intelligence. So that, yes, you have to read uh, Shakespeare for that uh, and blame Shakespeare for that. Um, we don't make, well, I say we didn't make uh, um, mustard in Shakespeare in the 19th or 20th century. We did try and do it industrially in the 19th century, that failed. But there is a little company outside of Shakespeare at the moment who is actually making genuine Shakespeare mustard which you can buy, and she's trying to get it, get a, a rule by that nobody else but her can make Tewkesbury mustard. So it's on the up again. But it's, to people in Tewkesbury, it's not that important. It's it's because you've read false stuff and you've read Henry the Fourth Part Two. You're interested, and it was an insult to people like that. So John, we just crossed the uh, one hour mark. Let let me um, let me give you one last question here. So uh, folks are interested in. Uh, what you're doing for, um, uh, I guess you guys are celebrating a big uh, anniversary in Tewksbury uh, next year. Uh, so uh, do, what does the town have planned and what does your organization have planned, if anything? I'm careless with the answer this better than me because she's involved. My very modest contribution is that we're digitizing all sorts of photographs of Tewksbury history so that it'll be available online for people in Chuckstree, Massachusetts, uh, to study themselves. So that's my humble contribution. It's a very time consuming con contribution, but that's what I'm doing. I don't know if, can Anne speak? Is, is, can you? I can, can you speak. Can anybody hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we can. Heart. Yes. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, we've got what a committee. What are we going to do? We get, we've got a committee that we're trying to plan all sorts of live events. Uh, we had a meeting. A, month, a week or two ago, just checking out what possibilities there still are. Basically now the festivals that we're planning will start on the anniversary of the battle in May and finish with the anniversary of the consecration of the Abbey in October. Um, what exactly will be happening, I think, is watch this space. There's been rumours of a Sonny Lumiere, there's been rumours um, of a horse ride from Gloucester to Tewkesbury replicating Margaret of Anjou's route, um, among many other things that are still being played with. I can certainly send you further details once we've got them a bit more firmed up. A good time to visit, I'm sure I will agree, is if you do Absolutely. come in now. Or they they're very good at replaying the Battle of Tewkesbury. It's very it's very uh, an energetic performance played by people who are experts in medieval warfare. It's, it's what and they get people from all over the world coming to take part. So if you're interested in medieval yes, at the warfare, first week of July, usually is whether you'll be doing it then. I don't know. You you probably know better than me. But we, well, they'd we, like to. It would depend on COVID. Uh, that's the problem with everything COVID, of course. That's the big uh, cloud. That's the big cloud over everything. Well, so let's John, have, and you can dispel that cloud. Mm. I, I, I uh, you know, if any of these events are going to be recorded uh, and posted virtually, uh, you know, Anne, Anne and John, please let us know. And so, John, do you have any uh, last words for the folks on the call and for the folks that are going to be watching uh, later on? No, but it's wonderful to be with you again. It's wonderful to replicate the, the welcome we had at Tewkesbury High School. And I hope my feelings have come over tonight how, how much we, we respect and enjoy that experience. So, Great. I'm so pleased to be able to help tonight. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, for being very generous with your time and putting this you know custom PowerPoint presentation together for us. We uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, I have a feeling this won't be the last time uh, that we'll be in touch. Uh, we have several uh, thank yous in the chat from folks who uh, found the presentation very interesting. And um, uh, so you might wanna check those, but we wanna uh, want thank everyone for coming uh, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. And uh, I will uh, end the call momentarily. So again, thank you all for coming. Look for the- uh, Thank you very much everybody in Massachusetts. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Anne. And uh, we'll see you all uh, another time. Uh, keep us updated on the uh, big anniversary celebration. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Robert. You've been great. Thank you, John. Have a good one, everyone.